Welcome to MedShark Insider with Bill Fukui, your expert host on all things medical marketing and SEO. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of MedShark Insider. Uh, today, I have a, a genuinely a good friend, uh, a colleague who's been in the digital marketing space uh, for cosmetic and plastic surgery for many years, but he also has a very diversified background. Um, and, and I think he's going to bring some insights that most, you know, digital marketing agencies and people are not able to address. So I think that's why I, I wanted to have him on this uh, show to really talk about some of the, uh, how do you incorporate, you know, capital investments in large, uh, you know, investments in either personnel, uh, technology, things like that. Um, and how do you do that in a cosmetic practice uh, without, you know, losing money, losing time. So today I've got Brent Cavender, who is the co-founder of MetaMed Marketing. Uh, and I've known uh, Brent for many years, uh, have tremendous respect for him as a innovator and really a, just a bigger thinker. Uh, so welcome today, Brent. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, back at you, uh, much respect. I really enjoyed that uh, we can collaborate as friendly competitors and, uh, it's just been fun knowing you in this space, Bill. Yeah. You know, Brett, I, I even removed the competitor word. I just consider you a friend. I consider you a friend. And if, you know, if there are situations where I can, you know, refer you clients and it's a good situation, you know, I'm going to do that. Um, but only because, again, I don't see you as a competitor. You're a, you're a colleague. Um, so give a little bit of background. I know you, but I want you to kind of share a little bit of your background with our audience and really how internet marketing and all that type of stuff can, can actually work in with some of your background in terms of capital investments and, and big purchases. Sure, sure. Um, so um, I've been in this particular industry segment for 12 years, but um, prior to that in prior lives, uh, I worked in... Um, uh, broadband, uh, telephones and uh, internet. I worked in automated robotics for, you know, highly pr precise movements down to microns and less. And then before that, um, I had a, a pretty uh, successful and long career in the semiconductor industry where I would uh, be flying off to uh, Taiwan frequently, Singapore often, wow. uh, you know, into China and uh, you know, throughout Europe, uh, we were working with large capital equipment e expenditures, and it was very involved. You, uh, you would spend maybe a million, maybe two million dollars on one piece of equipment that wow. would you know, put, be put into a clean room wafer fab. And the um, preparing the facilities for that equipment was just, a, it was an entire project in itself. And so, um, as I've as I've come over into the um, elective healthcare space and um, working as uh, a bit of a, a, obviously an ad agency with website optimization and design and promotion, digital marketing overall, you know, I've really kind of thought about how the practices are uh, sequencing the spend of their capital. Uh, and what I'm referring to specifically, and I say this with a <laughs> smile, is, um, you know, practice uh, managers and physicians, they, they go out to a different association shows and conferences, and there's a deal and you can't pass it up. And before you know it, about two or three weeks later, a piece of equipment is showing up in your practice. I'm sure you've seen the same. Yeah. You know, we had this conversation. It's amazing. Uh, you know, the pharmaceutical and, and technology sales sector, they're the best salespeople there are in the world. And when they, and when they get face to face with a doctor, it's, a, it's amazing the magic they can do. Um, sure, sure. But yeah, they end, up, they end up, you know, making commitments, signing papers at these meetings. And, and even though they've done a little homework prior to, they've not done the other things that, that I think you're familiar with. Uh, even though it's on their mind, they're thinking about it. Even when they go to the meeting, yeah, I'm thinking about, you know, this machine, I'm going to invest in a in mode laser or whatever. Um, and, and that's great. I love the fact that that surgeons are always trying to innovate, bring new technologies to their practice. 
to get patients, you know, better outcomes and more, uh, you know, satisfied expectations set, uh, and, and ultimately get more referrals from the services that they offer. I love that. Um, and as a marketer, I, I want more things that I can, you know, more tools that I can market and advertise, but that's not always turns into revenue. And that's what I'd like to talk to today is yeah. really what can practices do to, to effectively plan for and, you know, implement in terms of uh, when they're making large capital investments uh, into a practice. But half the time, they don't even tell us that, that, it's, that it's happening until, as you said, the machine's in their office. Uh, yeah. And they, sometimes they, didn't even, they don't even have the room for it someplace. You yeah. know, they got this machine show, well, where are we going to put this? Well, I don't know, we'll figure it out, you know, kind of thing. And sadly, the payment requirements begin immediately. <laughs> so... You know, if you were to take a, you know, go up to 30,000 feet and think about the problem, and we obviously want to offer a solution, but the problem is that this is the ultimate putting the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by that? What, what, what we mean to say is that, okay, when you buy a large piece of a capital equipment, or maybe it's you build out a facility or maybe you hire some you know, new physician or personnel for your practice. Those are big expenses and they start incurring immediately. Mm -hmm. However, those expenses should support some return on investment, but that return can't come until there's a demand built up for that particular laser, for the new facilities, for the new personnel. And uh, what we're talking about is flipping it mm -hmm. so that the, the practice is doing slightly more due diligence on the front end to ensure that they vetted the product, there's a market demand, they know where it's going to go, they can make the installation and facilitation of it as, as smooth as possible so that they're minimizing their expense, minimizing the disruption to their practice, but what we're really saying is that while those things are expensive and they, and they show up immediately on your dock, the demand that you need to build up so that you have a revenue stream that is paying for those, those capital expenses, that takes time. It's relatively affordable. It's, it's ridiculously affordable to, to build up the marketing, but you have to be thinking ahead longer term and it, this just comes down to project management. Okay. And, and, you know, it gets a little, it's a, I'm going to get cheesy on you just for a moment. <laughs> we'll have some fun with this. But I always think of it as turkey dinner on Thanksgiving Day, mm -hmm. right? You've got, you've got six or eight dishes that you want to all come out at the same time. And in our case, in the practice, it's, it's about the demand for the machine coming online just before you actually receive the machine so that you can schedule people in the first few weeks of, of having that new laser or having the new personnel or facilities. Does that make sense? Or is you, know, that... you know, I, I, I love the analogy because my wife doesn't cook. <laughs> uh, and when, when turkey dinner happens at our house, and there's usually about 25 people coming over, yep. um, you know, when we have like a, a, a Christmas dinner, we'll do turkey and prime rib, we'll do the whole, whole thing. And you're right, just having everything come out and you as the cook, we all know you as the cook, you want everything to be perfect, everything right. to be warm when it's supposed to be warm, um, nothing dried out or whatever. And yep. part of that is timing, you know, yep. if, if, if that turkey sits too long, and you've already carved that thing, it's already starting to dry out. You know, exactly. I want people as soon as they're sitting down that it's, it's happening. So I absolutely agree with you on, on that. Um, so what, if a practice is looking to say a surgeon has been, you know, and we get, they get inundated by uh, sales reps and, you know, marketing of different technologies and, mm -hmm. and even, they're on, uh, uh, on forums or stuff and people are talking about uh, new technology. Ooh, we started doing this technology mm -hmm. or they're talking to a colleague. You got to look into this. This is like really, you know, uh, the outcomes are really good. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to spend a lot of time. It cuts my time down in half or whatever. So they get interested in this. What's the first step they need to be? What, what are some, you know, maybe not the first step, but what are some first steps that you typically see as either missed <laughs> and uh -huh. then they, you know, and then all of a sudden it just dominoes down, you know, domino effect. Um, but what are the, the handful of really upfront things that you see being missed that if you do these things, even if not everything is in, in line, you'll cover, it's that 80, you know, 80, 20 rule, cover yeah. these 20% of the things yeah. and, and that'll get you 80% of the way there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's ironic that the probably the most valuable things that practice managers and physicians in charge of these large capital equipment expenditures, the, the easiest things they could do that would give them the biggest bang for the buck cost them nothing, cost them li almost nothing. Uh, cost them a little bit of time, uh, but it's just being st smart and strategic and thinking in terms of project management. And so the first thing they really should be doing is they should be talking to their web vendors to ask whether or not there's demand across the country. What are they oh. hearing from other practices, other doctors? What are the results? What is the demand? What are the nuances around trying to optimize for it? And you would know better than anybody, Bill. What's one of the first things you do? You go look at the keyword research. What's the traffic around the particular mm -hmm. Um, technology that they're interested in. Right. And, and I think even, you know, when you're doing that, it doesn't always have to be, just to be clear, it doesn't have to be for the technology itself. It mm -hmm. could be for the problems that that, that, that technology is solving. Mm -hmm. So there are certain types of, you know, if it, you're talking, talk, you know, I'll just use cool sculpting as an example, because we're all familiar with that. Mm -hmm. when, when cool sculpting first came out, Nobody knew what it was. It wasn't a branded product to the consumer marketplace. Nobody knew what cool sculpting was. So there, there was an education process that took place where consumers now, you look at Google Trends and you can see people are actually looking for cool sculpting almost as a Kleenex, you mm -hmm. know, a version of Kleenex. It's, it's, um, it's a brand. It's, it's a brand. Exactly. A known brand. Yeah, but but not every technology, newer technology, or something that you're going to be bringing into the practice does immediately. There's a demand for at least from a search standpoint because they just don't know what it is. But that doesn't mean they're not looking for the 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 problems and solutions for those problems and looking for content uh, and options for those those problems. That's where I say you start by looking at what's the consumer demand for the problems that this technology solves. Yeah. And with and that, then you can start piggybacking and starting to brand just so, you know, are you familiar with, with cool sculpting or, or with in mode or with, you know, a uh, body tight or whatever it may be that they're, no, I'm not familiar with that. You know? So it's like, Ooh, I, now all of a sudden you can start introducing that brand, but mm -hmm. you can't start off assuming that, that the marketplace is going to facilitate it. That's exactly right. And not to get too much into the sausage making, but I know that y you and I, we, we think in terms of keyword research every day, but for our audience, the folks that are interested in, well, you know, how, how does this work? I always like to think about the keyword research as a marriage between there's a geographical term and there's a contextual term. All right, let's break down that contextual term a little bit further. The contextual term can be, as you say, it can be the desired result, mm -hmm. a great complexion, or um, I don't know, uh, a, a better body sculpting, something. Mm -hmm. It can be a condition. It can be a medical discipline. It can be, um, it can be the name of a procedure, or as we've identified, it can be a branded name. So there's various contextual terms, but oh, you said it beautifully. It isn't about thinking in terms of a name. It's about thinking in terms of what the audience, mm -hmm. the potential uh, patient is thinking in. Are they thinking in the problem? Are they thinking in the solution? Are they thinking in the desired result? And, and, then, and then knowing that those various contextual terms and obviously knowing some geographies around the country, we can go out and do some, some keyword mm -hmm. research and we can really give 
practices a good indication of whether or not their timing is, is, is right? Is it beginning to hit? Has it already moved into the branded uh, name mm -hmm. phase where that's recognized? It, it's right. a little bit of a fun science even, really. Mm -hmm. So if, if let, let's take, for example, we got a practice, doctor looks into it, says, Brent, I'm looking into to purchasing this, uh, this technology and it does this. Are you familiar with it? No, I'm we'll not. Call it the Frammer Jammer Laser. Okay, Frammer Jammer Laser, and it just <laughs> does incredible things. Um, I'm not familiar with it, so we'll do a little due diligence on that. I'll get get familiar with it. Um, mm -hmm. But let's say we we do enough research and we say, you know, Doc, this this looks good. You know, this looks really good. I think there's opportunity. I see demand locally for this this type of service mm -hmm. uh, or the solution that this technology brings, mm -hmm. um, what would be the next step? What would, an, you know, once you give the green light and says, doc, I think we should, we should move forward with something like this. Yeah, so we're assuming that the, the doctor or the, the physician, the practice manager has talked to their vendors. They've, uh, they've uh, solidified that there's demand out there. They've potentially done some keyword research. Uh, then what, uh, what you're going to then start considering is, okay, let's start thinking channels, all right? So now we start uh, really kind of distinguishing different channels and what sequencing they should be addressing the, you know, the need to get the word out about this. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, going a little bit into the sausage making and maybe even getting a little bit onto my soapbox, um, it does feel that often people are so um, quick to go right to social media has got to be this, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or I've got to have a video about this. Yeah. These are all, these are all excellent initiatives and they can all pay a, a, a positive return on investment. But if you really want to maximize your return on investment on any one of those channels, hmm, where are people likely going to go directly after learning about this on the social media channel in order to, to credential the doctor, to learn about their facilities, where are they located, uh, what other procedures do they do, uh, do they even like the way these people, you know, uh, the look and the feel of their website so that they can uh -huh. see that they're a professional group. In other words, that's a long way to say, hey, you better carve out a space in your website for a particular procedure. And again, you and I, we, we do this every day and we talk with our, our clients. It's gotta be a dedicated page. It has to have unique copy. It has to be copy that's optimized and lengthy and formatted properly. There's so many nuances to what we do around proper promotion mm -hmm. of procedures for practices that are really looking to hit a home run in their, in their marketing efforts. You know, and you kind of touch on on get all the planning that that comes into you know promoting that you know both in social media on the website, but you know I think where practices many times fail to really because they need to start feeding the beast, they need to start getting a return on that investment because we don't have Nike dollars or McDonald's dollars to float on technology or anything else, and quite frankly, most of my surgeon friends or doctor friends or cl clients, they have about this much patience <laughs> to, to start seeing, you know, things happen. They, they're impatient to see results. I would also say, start thinking about some paid stuff mm -hmm. because, you know, if I need to immediately start priming the pump, I don't always want to wait for organic to, to happen. I say, you got to start incorporating a more diverse. So I, I agree with you on the social media stuff. And, and certainly organically starting to optimize what kind of keyword phrases people are looking for in that, those uh, technologies and making sure I've got really good optimized pages that can uh -huh. quickly. And, and a lot of times for some new technologies and stuff, you can show up pretty quickly on organic, but it still takes time. Exactly. It still takes and, time. And I think, I think that, that that is at the core of what we're trying to um to evangelize about today. Uh, although you said something else that was at the core and that is patience and planning. <laughs> I, I, you said it so well. 
the organic side of it, hey, you know, developing out the page, finding the right space for it so that it's in a well-organized menu structure, um, making sure that the practice has approved the copy, you've got the right graphics, everything's laid out beautifully before you pull the trigger. That could take a month. That could take a couple of months if, if the practice isn't responding. Um, we, we do this every day, you know this. But, um, but then beyond that, on the organic side of our business, the search engines seem to have built into their algorithms a camouflaging tool that requires that you're going to be up there for a while with good content, it's fresh, it's properly organized, it's getting uh, the kind of traction with people that go to that page. So there's all these different um, uh, factors that are going to signal to the search engines that the page is worth moving up in the list. And that takes time. But wouldn't it be great if during that time when you were building up the organic search volume for that particular frammer jammer technology mm -hmm. that we're talking about, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if you didn't already have to have the space allocated, you could be using it for other things, you weren't making monthly payments already, yeah. Um, there's just, you know, if you flip it, you put the, the horse before the cart, it just makes sense that you would really start to build up your demand three, four, five months yeah. before you actually accept yeah. the shipment of that equipment. Yeah. I think building up the demand for it is absolutely, it's, I'll use the example of, um, you know, this recent pandemic that we've had, we've had, you know, last year, we had practices, you know, all of the elective surgery was shut down in, in hospitals and uh, ASCs. You couldn't even do cosmetics. And yet some of those practices have reported to me and a large number of them. Last year, what you know, 2020 was actually one of their most profitable years that they've ever had. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and not just because their, you know, their overhead was cut because some of their, and, and they got some stimulus money and, you know, to help, help pay for some staff and things like that. But all that aside, their gross revenues was up because when they were able to, you know, now see patients uh, and do surgeries, man, they had such a line of patients already, this pent up demand ready to go. And the other thing was their staff. And I'll, I'm going to address this too, but they had staff now that was highly motivated, man. They were going, we as a team, because during this pandemic, we're in this together. It, that sense of camaraderie and going, everybody going out of their way to do things to make a difference now was important. And, and I think what doesn't make us, you know, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger kind of thing. Uh -huh. I think there were some really, really positive things that happened in practices, you know, during the pandemic that we can take moving forward. Um, Agreed 100%, Bill that it forced practices to think longer term, be more strategic, because they had that time to do all these activities. Uh, you know, the, the idea of, you know, what's urgent, what's not urgent, what's important, what's not important. I, my team always teases me about this. I think it's the fourth quadrant. It's the fourth quadrant. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, the stuff that's, it's not urgent, but it's important. Important. Yeah, and, and I would even, I, I, while I agree 100%, I would even add to that, that it created a sense of seriousness with the patient base, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they, you know, in their minds, they, they were thinking, well, this might be my window to get this done, and I might not have this uh, window come back around for some time, in addition to the fact that they were thinking, hey, I'm not out in society right now, <laughs> now's the time yeah. to have some cosmetic procedures completed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, taking advantage of those types of things, I, I think that's creative thinking. I think that's, uh, that's strategic thinking. Uh, and that minimizes the risk. I mean, we all want to mitigate risk as much as we can mm -hmm. when it comes to business, business development, uh, and, and quite frankly, advertising, spending mm -hmm. money on marketing uh, or technology. We want to mitigate as much of the risk as we can, and that's with planning. That's with well thought out messaging. So for example, there's times when I see practices say, oh, I really wanna promote this. I've been trying to get this kind of business. 
and, and I, my, my current web marker is not able to do it. And I'm like, well, let me take a look at the website. And I go to the home page of the website and I said, I don't see anything on here that you even do this. I'm like, well, it's on this page. I said, well, if it's so important, it's gotta be on the home page if it's that important. He's like, oh no, well, just go to the navigation. I said, if people have to, you know, search to find it, they're not gonna get to it. Mm -hmm. If it's that important, if we're gonna promote and we're spending money on this stuff, man, make sure that it's in highly visible places. And we all know that the homepage gets far more traffic than any page on the website in most cases, mm -hmm. in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I go to that and it's little things like that um, that we can start introducing things and take advantage of traffic and visibility we already have. There's already traffic coming to that site. Mm -hmm. Whether we do any marketing whatsoever, additional for it, mm -hmm. there's traffic already there. Let's take advantage of the visibility that our website and our, you know, digital marketing agency has earned for that website. And let's take advantage of that visibility on top of maybe what we can be doing in other advertising and marketing, but absolutely take advantage of the traffic that's already there. I mean, it's yeah, already there. Yeah. Well, I love, I love that you bring up risk management. I mean, you, uh, you know, gosh forbid, you might, uh, you might try to build demand in your marketing mm -hmm. for a very relatively low price than a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment. Right. And you might learn there's no interest. Yeah. And, and of course you've probably had the same experience as we have of practices that they already had purchased the laser. Then they wanted to build up demand. And then right when they had received their laser and it, nobody was really wanting to do it. They wanted to, they, they literally sent it back. Yeah. Well, of course <laughs> you're, you're not going to be successful with it. You, you don't have people lining up to, to set up appointments yet for it because you didn't give it that, that relatively affordable time and investment in order to get the, the demand built up. You know, the, a, and this is from personal experience. This is back in the, we all have, are familiar with, with laser vision correction, LASIK surgery, you know, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we were doing, I was doing back, you know, we, I was in the uh, TV and, and media advertising business to when uh, the Exomer laser was approved for vision correction surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were all jazzed about when the FDA, and we knew when it was going to approve it pretty much. Um, and so we had created TV commercials and radio spots for clients all over the country. And as soon as it got approved, the expectation from the ophthalmologist, from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, was that they were predicting almost 2 million procedures being done in the first year after hmm. approval. Fact of the matter is it was slightly over a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm the expectations were so enormous mm -hmm. and companies spent all this money. I mean, there was one laser manufacturer that purchased Jimmy Cliff's version of I can see clearly now, <laughs> I, if you recall that song, I mean, great song for, yeah, for vision right. correction surgery. <laughs> you could not get a better song. No, I think they paid about a quarter of a million dollars for that, the rights to use that for their advertising. Wow. Uh, that company went out of business after about a little over a year. They went out of business. Yeah. Okay. That's because of poor planning. Um, they yeah. didn't realize that the marketplace was not ready for this. It was going to take years for it to develop enough confidence because people are very phobic about their eyes. I mean, you can have surgery on a lot of, but don't mess with my eyes, man. That's, yeah. that's a scary yeah. thing. You know, so they didn't anticipate that, even though the results were, gee, they had 90 plus percent mm -hmm. at 20, 40 and better, regardless of what, you know, um, your prescription was, the outcomes were in incredible, mm -hmm. but yet the consumers were still not familiar with it. In fact, half of them still called it cataract surgery, you know, which is very different, mm -hmm. um, but they just didn't know. So it, it took some time for it to, to mature, but so many businesses they invested and the cost of an extra laser at that time was about a half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Holy cow. It was, it was incredible what happened, but I think that's on a, on an industry wide scale. 
that happens on the micro scale in practices every day. Well, it's, uh, you know, maybe I'm getting a little bit too into the details of it, but, uh, you know, in, t in eight years of uh, running this agency, along with my business partner, um, 12 years in the industry, uh, when you're looking at the entire sequence of events that occurs in digital marketing, there, there really aren't ones and zeros, meaning you don't go from nothing to something all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's ramp ups, some faster than others. Other, you know, with one exception, the launch of a, a new website, the launch of a new social campaign. Yeah, that's a one or a zero. There wasn't something there, but now there is. But in general, the audience demand, the audience traffic, the number of inquiries coming in, um, the number uh, within the practice, the ability for them to actually, um, you know, close an inquiry all the way to a service scheduled and completed. It's, it's not a one or a zero. It, it, you get a little better, a little better, a little better, which is all, it, it's all really um, good incentive to um, iterate, not to look for, you don't want to try to hit home runs out of the ballpark every time. It's, yeah, you can go for the occasional home run, but I think the people that are super successful, they're thoughtful, they're strategic, they think long-term, they believe that an investment actually pays a return an investment in marketing is not an expense with no return it is an investment that has a return if it's done correctly right. if it's done in the right sequence and if it's done at the right uh at the right rate in other words how much how aggressive are you should you be more aggressive less aggressive uh again this Again, it's very cheesy but i i you know i go back to thinking about it in terms of project management what are all the things we need to do to have a successful outcome? Mm -hmm. What sequence do they, do they occur in? What are the long lead time items? That's the turkey, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, in our industry segment, it's the copywriting typically with these websites, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. If you're going to do it right. Yeah. No, and I, I completely agree. And, you know, I talked about this touched on it really, really early in our conversation today, but I want to go back to it. And that is internally when you guys, uh, when a practice makes the decision to move forward with new technology or a new process or a new surgeon or whatever, they got to get their team in, you know, they got to get buy-in from the team. They got to get the team because these are the, you know, if you really want to turn this into revenue immediately, You've already got a lot of patients coming into the into the practice who are already candidates for this. Okay, that's why you're bringing this technology in here because you've seen patients that, where this can help, mm -hmm. and you got to train staff members to kind of keep their radar open so that they can start feeding you know surgical or or technology you know patients and directing them in the right place. Because otherwise, if we really don't get them to buy in, they'll keep sending patients doing the same thing that they normally do, but they've never been really trained to, to, to look at patients or ask them the right questions or, or position services or technology in a way that they can actually, quite frankly, sell the surgery or sell the technology. So there's got to be in that planning, what you're talking about, I completely agree on the planning thing. There's got to be a, a, a patient or an internal process so that we can start not necessarily just eating what we kill for marketing, but mm -hmm. there's already patients here. There's mm -hmm. patients here every day that we can turn into immediately into more profitable mm -hmm. and higher, you know, return on investment types of treatments. But bottom line, the patients are going to be happier. Mm -hmm. Okay, if the recovery time or why we're investing in this technology, at the end of the day, it always boils down to the patient's experience and outcomes. If we can continue to focus on those things, our core business, and I'm a marketer, but I will always say the healthiest practice isn't the ones with the biggest budgets. It's the ones that, that really have a better product. Okay, Marketing can't save a bad product. And if uh -huh. you're just doing it to make money, I mean, yeah, we're all in this to make money. I get it. But never lose sight of the fact it is about the patients, the patient's mm -hmm. experience and the, and the patient's outcomes. 
And if you focus on those types of things, this is easy to sell. It's easy to sell new things, new technologies, and, and staff can get so behind it that they're, I mean, they're, they're excited. You almost have to, you know, create this environment where, man, we're, we're going to, I can't wait to talk to patients about this stuff. You, you know, it's, uh, you say that it, it, you're really hitting it where we need to, to be hitting it. And that is about preparing everybody, thinking about it as a process, thinking long, long term. And, and I know that you know this better than anyone else in the industry that we work in. You know, this, we, this is why I think we've been such nice friends for, for years. Your idea of selling, as you're talking about the patients, uh, you know, um, getting some kind of interaction with the staff, it is about educating. Mm -hmm. When you're educating, you're selling. My poor team is so tired of hearing me say this, but <laughs> we don't sell, we educate. And if we do a good job of education, we will sell ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I mean, it's just as simple as that. So boy, you bring up such a great point, Bill, that within the process of, you know, when do you do this channel? When do you do that channel? How aggressively do you go? Do you bring PPC in? Are, are you doing organic? And you're thinking about the whole thing from 30,000, 20,000 feet up. Uh, uh, an element of it has to be building some, um, you know, some excitement, some enthusiasm, mm -hmm. some passion, and doing some internal education to your team so that they can properly evangelize about this new opportunity for patients. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, the most immediate thing that I see with almost every practice that's really successful at doing this is they get their patients behind and, and they're actually having their patients have these procedures and treatments done so that they can experience it firsthand. Um, as opposed to just trying to sell it to everybody else. Um, when you get people that says, you know what, I'd like to try that myself. This looks yeah. like I can, you know, it was like when we would have uh, in, in the uh, cosmetic or in the refractive surgery arena, man, there is nothing like having a, a patient care counselor who's had LASIK talking to a LASIK, you know, potential patient. Yeah. Nothing like that. You yeah. can't replace the experience. So, uh, you know, again, get your staff involved. I mean, get the people that are going to be selling this so that they are passionate about it. Um, and, and when it comes to social media, guess what they're doing? <laughs> they're doing social media themselves, exactly. uh, yeah. you know, yeah. It, it, that's where it like really pays off is, is when it's real, when the outcomes and the results are real. And authenticity inspires. I love it that moves, word. It moves people. Mm -hmm. Whereas in authenticity, if that's even a word. Yeah. I, people, I, I believe it's an important word. <laughs> people, people smell it. <laughs> they feel it. And, and, you know, between, you know, education, authenticity, passion, excitement about something, you just can't help but move other people towards a, towards a, a different direction on some new technology. Yeah. Well, you know, Brent, I loved having this conversation with you. You, you, but, you inspired me. This was, this conversation came from, came from you. And, and I think it's, it, it, it's a topic that really should be addressed more in practices and I invite practices that are really thinking about hiring a new, new uh, associate, building another office, uh, introducing new technologies or uh, expanding their, uh, their practice to include, you know, uh, non-surgical if they, they don't do that already, uh, mm -hmm. how to plan for those types of things. I encourage them to, to reach out to you. I mean, because you, you're, you're really good on the planning side of it uh, and you think differently than most of my uh, marketing colleagues, I would say, you know, in general. Uh, Thank you. There, there are some good people out there, but I would say I would put you in that category that I would trust you to give good advice to, uh, you know, to a practice with, without any pretense of you have to buy something from me. Um, so that's what I like about you. So Brent, I'm actually going to, if you have, if anybody is interested in, in reaching out to Brent, well, what's the best way to, to reach you? Uh, best way is to, to catch me through my website, it, which is at uh, MetaMed Marketing, M-E-T-A-M-E-D Marketing. 
Um, email address is Brent period C at MetaMed Marketing. Um, and that, that, that should get them to me. Okay. That sounds great. Um, yeah, I encourage you to, to reach out to Brent. He's a great guy. Uh, and I think we think very similarly uh, about, you know, at the end of the day, if we can help practices, many of them will become clients. But the ones that do become clients, they, they are the best clients mm -hmm. because there is a, you know, uh, a common uh, understanding. We don't rush sales. The, the, the worst sales happen when is when somebody feels uh, threatened or they're, uh, you know, really haven't put the thought into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want those kind of clients. I want clients that really kind of think through what it is that we're, what our value is, what they need. And if that's a good fit, not mm -hmm. necessarily, uh, you know, I need this and I need it done tomorrow. Those mm -hmm. usually turn out to be short-term relationships. So uh, I'm only smiling bill because all of my clients have had the talk. <laughs> and the talk is right before they're about to sign on with us. We have the talk that, Hey, I need to let you know, this is hard. It takes patience. It takes persistence. Uh -huh. But here's the good news. If you, can, if you can have the faith to get to the process, project management with us, then when we've launched your website and we've given it a couple of months of you know, strong promotion, guess who it's going to be hard for then? Yeah. And that seems to really excite people. But it also sets expectations appropriately. Right. I think, that, I think that's only fair. Well, Brent, thank you again. I, you know, I, I will have you on in a, in a future show. Uh, oh, that'd be great. And, and yeah. We'll talk about some other topics, but I, I, I'm so glad that you brought this one, uh, you know, brought this up in our last conversation, and I'm glad we can share some of this insight, some of your insights, uh, you know, with my audience. It's been fun. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Take care, Brent. Have a great right. day. See you, man. Thanks for joining us for the Med Shark Insider with Bill Fukui. Join us next week for another dive into all things medical marketing. All episodes can be streamed at www.medsharkdigital.com slash medshark-insider.